session, and I'm not going to make that much of an um, introduction because we really sound like he doesn't need any introduction. Um, just like yesterday, I said that Ellie Harari, when I introduced him, had changed everybody's lives in the room. We've got, you know, Steve Wozniak, he's changed everybody else's, everybody's lives in the room, too, with, uh, you know, what, what he did several years ago. Something interesting, though, is that he has, you know, made his money, he's gone out and done an awful lot of uh, philanthropic things since then, and one of them is to uh, teach grade school children how to use computers, for which he's gotten something called the Heinz Award, and uh, the interesting twist with that is that my kids met Steve Wozniak several years before I ever did. So I'm a little bit jealous of that. But anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Steve Wozniak. He's going to give us a half hour uh, talk about how the world is going to change again because of man flash storage um, in enterprise systems. So Steve. Uh, so I get what I'm going to talk about. And I thought about it and I decided, you know, there's conference after conference after conference here, and you've been sitting through them and you've got projections and you, you listen to the same details about the different types of non-volatile memory and what other characteristics are. So I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to let you off the hook. And I'm going to just talk about interesting, fun stories of my own technology life when it ran into little things like memory. Before I begin, I'm going to talk about Fusion IO, the company I'm with. And, you know, when, when I met the people in this company, you know, they sat down there and they had developed a technique of spreading out a lot of these little low-powered disk chips and making very high-powered disk equivalent plugged into the PCI bus in the computer. And a venture capitalist, you know, they would have had easy venture capital money if they just did what everyone else did. Take this phrase that had been going around in the world, solid state disk, solid state disk. It was a well-known phrase. Just do what everyone else does. And when you're in school, you're always taught that the right answer is the same answer everyone else has. If they all have it, it must be right. You know, and the founders sat there and they said, no, 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 no. What we've got is really something better and special and more thought out and more efficient and really does the job that's needed better. And they stuck with their guns and uh, fortunately got to where they've gotten to. So I'm glad to be a part of them now. You know, starting with memories, you know, you go back to your life and almost everybody in this room is probably, you know, a lot of us are techies and grew up with the little crystal radio sets. And for me, the first memory device I ever had was a relay. And you could put a little signal on a relay and it might latch and hold a signal. What did I learn from that? Well, I learned that if you touch a relay coil when it releases, you get a big shock. <laughs> and I learned, probably that was the early start that I learned that I was a hardware guy. Once you felt some pain for what you do, you know what you are. I have a little device at home that I bought. And it's got four places that four people can put their fingers in. And like a Russian roulette, it goes, beep, a little light goes around, beep, 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 beep. And where it stops, the person gets shocked. <laughs> Hardware guys will instantly stick their fingers in to play the game. Software guys won't dare touch it, the idea of being shocked. And it's, it's absolutely true, we have something in common. It's like when you worked on the old television sets, you all got eventually shocked by 10,000 to 20,000 volts and thrown backwards a few feet. And it's something you just sort of go through and it's part of life, it's part of being what we are. Um, thank God though that I missed building memory devices and logic devices out of vacuum tubes. I don't think I would have gone for that. I was a ham radio operator at age 10 and built my ham radios out of tubes, but thank God they were only analog to me. Uh, I would have had probably, it might have set me back and I might have decided never to go into computers if that's what it took to build one bit of memory, a couple of vacuum tubes. Um, it, by high school, I was, I, I really had fallen in love with computers just by total accident. We never had any courses any books, anyone teaching me, telling me what to do, discovered it all on my own, and I somehow taught myself, just because I wanted to figure out how to do it, looked at computer architecture, looked at chip manuals, and taught myself to somehow make the chips into a computer on paper. I made a game, and I did it over and over and over. I got to where I could look at any one of the mini computers of the late 60s and design it in one or two days. And then sometimes I would think about it, for two months after that, trying to think of a way to save one little chip 
There's four little NAND ones on this guy and two little ores. What if I use an exclusive ore? And then I could say one package maybe. And um, thinking out all those little things, it forces you to get better and better. And you don't being paid. You don't get a grade in school. You don't have any of those extrinsic rewards that all of the world can see. You don't have yachts and a big salary. You don't win awards. You just feel happy in your brain. You're doing what you, you achieved a little goal. You solved the puzzle. It doesn't have to be important to anyone else in the world. You don't even have anyone to tell that you're good at. I didn't think I'd ever design computers in my life as a job. I just did it for fun. You know, it's the same thing. I didn't ever really want money. It just happened. You know, and that wasn't really the end goal. Well, I told my dad, someday I'm going to own a 4K Nova computer. 4K means 4K bytes of memory. Why 4K bytes of memory? It was the minimum you needed to be able to type in programs, like in Fortran, and solve problems of the world. That made a computer useful. I don't really care. Looking back, nowadays, I was a techie then. Nowadays, I don't care how many K bytes it is. I just care about the job I got done. The world is becoming more that way. That's the way Steve Jobs always tells me. You have to think of things. People don't want to know what the, the, the technology is, just what job it does and how well. At a certain point in my life, I, I kind of felt like paying my own way through college and not burdening my parents. So I took a year off from college to work and earn the money. I programmed a computer, walked into a room in Sunnyvale. They were building a medium-sized computer at the heart of it, the storage. It was this big, huge vacuum cleaner-sized machine with a hard disk that you took out on clamps and it had a bunch of layers and it was 20 megabytes. Wow, and you could run an entire company on this thing. The California DMV bought two of these machines and ran with them for about 20 years. When they finally upgraded to a tandem machine, 100, $125 million or something, they had to sue tandem because it didn't work. So these were really great machines I lucked into. And while I was there, you know, all technology should have a fun element. When you work on something for your own reasons, you're so motivated. You learn techniques, you teach yourself ways to be an engineer, ways to design things. What is correct, what isn't correct comes into, you know, your own values of engineering come about. But sometimes you have to do your own things as well as your company things. And here was a case, I was at this company and one night I went in, I'm on their computer and I run in a little program in machine language that would calculate E to 138,000 places. And, oh, one of the, one of the sons of the, the, the president or something came in and, oh, he just said that was a bad thing. Why was I doing this? Like, why wasn't I doing company work? But the understanding is, when you're doing your own stuff, you're improving your own intellect and your brain, and it's, more, it's be really better to apply to even the company jobs. And when I worked at Hewlett Packard later, they actually recognized it that way. Um, Around that time, I, I mean, I designed all these computers and could never afford a part in my life. Steve Jobs and I both had zero money, zero savings accounts, zero rich relatives, no, nothing we could sell to get money. So it was that way. And this was before I met Steve. It was actually right when I met him. I, one of the guys in my company, one of the executives uh, asked, why didn't I ever build these computers that I designed? I said, I could never afford a single chip. He said, oh, he had connections with the chip companies here in Silicon Valley. And uh, I said, whoa, whoa, okay, I'll go home and design a computer tonight. I designed a fresh one of my own, a simple, small computer, and he got me the chips. And the heart of it was memory. To me, memory of all the mini computers back then were big magnetic core planes and, you know, transistors to boost the signals up at a certain speed and rate and send the signals down the lines. And that was a complication because I was kind of um, very up on digital and chips and logic. Well, this, this executive said that um, there were two companies. Intel was making 256-bit RAMs. And here was this other company, Intercell, with a little I, was making 256-bit RAMs. He got me eight of those Intercell chips, plugged them into this little computer, and it was a little 256-byte computer, just like the Altair was going to be five years later. And uh, it actually went and it ran programs. And one of the nice things about when you build stuff yourself, you could destroy it yourself. So there I was, showing it to a newspaper, you know, a little publicity, running a couple little programs that I punched in ones and zeros on switches and got them into memory. And then I accidentally stepped on a power cord, nothing was protected, and it shorted 35 volts out to all the TTL chips. And that was, that was it for that little cream soda computer. 
But I, I met Steve Jobs. I built the thing with a friend. He said, you got to meet another guy from our high school. He likes electronics and he likes pranks. Okay. I want to meet a guy that likes electronics and likes fun all the time. Um, he doesn't like fun that much, but okay. <laughs> it's hard. It, one, you know, it's funny, but I think back, how many times I see Steve Jobs just you know, reel out in laughter like you would in good comedy. And it's pretty seldom. And we did a lot of pranks together. But it wasn't really, he wasn't really a laugher at the pranks. He more wanted to find a way to turn it into money. And, but one, one time when we introduced the Apple II computer, I had made a fake brochure that made it sound like there was another product with a lot of these similar features. And I wrote the ad as poorly as I could. And two sides, I had a comparison chart to the Apple and to the inside and to the other machines around. And it was a phony chart. The categories were things like performance, hardware, Software. They all had numbers rating them. So it was pretty funny. Well, Steve Jobs said, no, 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 this is what he saw. This is real. Because at the bottom it said, it said, Psychoback is a trademark of Borg Werner. You know, so I mean, I did a really good job on it. Well, 12 years later, presented him one of those in a, in a, a, a glass enclosure to put on the, the wall at his birthday. And he'd never known that I was the one who had done it. So when he saw it, he burst out into laughter. That was the time. So, he can laugh. When I worked at Hewlett Packard, um, not long after, after my third year of college, I was working again to earn the money for college. But I got a super job working on the HP 35 and the follow on the scientific calculators that were really changed the world. You know, almost as much as personal computers. Back then, that was the hot gadget that within a couple of years, every scientist, every engineer had to own one of these $400 devices. And that's what, 2,000 of today's dollars at least. You know, it was expensive, but boy, it was, it was the only way to go. And what a great thing. And we had six micron rules on our chips, as I recall, how tight you can space the transistors on a chip. So we could only fit about 1,000 transistors on a chip. Hence, the processor and this little calculator took two chips, one for arithmetic, one for control and timing. And, and, and that was on a one bus. Not eight, not four bits, not eight bits, not 16 bits. One bit, little bus wires running. But it didn't have to be super fast and uh, work. Now, a lot of people think that to Hewlett Packard calculators, what would you say about the early ones that you really remember about them? RPN, I heard it. RPN, right? RPN. Oh man, RPN is something computer scientists learn. Our calculators are powerful. They can calculate more powerful equations than all the other little people who talk about parentheses and arithmetic formulas and this is real power stuff. Well, it turns out that actually the R it was RPN because there wasn't enough space in the ROMs. The ROM memories could only hold about 500 bytes. And three of them ran the entire HP 35 there wasn't enough room to parse the equations, the way humans write them with parentheses, and convert them into the order to do things. So have you hit a button? Six.